Hey friends, Gary Frazier here once again. Thank you for joining us for our session uh, number seven in our series entitled Joy is More Than a Name. And uh, again, you know, you're just to remind all of us that uh, Paul is in prison writing this epistle, this letter to the church at Philippi. And uh, we're just having a great time studying together. I hope you're being blessed. I know that I am as I study to prepare uh, each and every uh, week uh, to spend this time with you. Now, before we jump in this morning, I want to just remind those of you who are interested, I am leading another Pastors and Friends trip to Israel, December 4 through 13. This come, that is this coming December. And I realize it's a little bit of short notice, but nevertheless, it's an opportunity that you have to spend 10 days walking where Jesus walked. It is a trip of a lifetime. I'm telling you that uh, a friend of mine, one of our guides, sent me an incredible picture from over the city of Tel Aviv <clears throat> a few days ago, and it's absolutely beautiful. But uh, we'll be taking only about 50 people. One bus all, is all, and I'll be there personally leading and teaching along with one of my uh, outstanding guides will be with us as well. The hotels are fabulous, all foods included. This is a turnkey deal. The only thing you need uh, money for will be a soft drink, souvenirs, and bottled water. Everything else is included. And uh, this price is $54.88 from Dallas. But wherever you need to come from, we can work that all out. Uh, if coming to Dallas would be an issue for you and get you a flight from your own home city. So anyway, if you're interested in that, you need to contact me uh, either uh, uh, at my email. Uh, that is uh, gary at dcttravel.com or call me at 817-715-0840. Or you can even call the Discovery Cruise and Tourist Office at 817-595-2700 and uh, they can help you as well. <clears throat> but uh, time and space is limited, so I hope you'll be able to join us. Now with that in mind, uh, let's pray together this morning. We're going to jump into our study. Father, in the name of Jesus, once again we approach the throne of God because of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. We have entrance before you. So bless our, friend, our family and friends today. As we study the Word of God together, bless all who will not only be seeing this live, but those who will be uh, viewing this in the days and weeks, perhaps months, even years to come. So we thank you for the inerrant Word of the living God. So we take it and use it and apply it to our lives to transform us more into the image of Jesus is our prayer in your name. Amen. Well, today we're going to jump into... Uh, uh, our study. But before we do, I want to just remember, remind us, uh, as I shared briefly last week, that there were no verses or chapter breaks in Scripture originally. And I know that you know that, but the verses were added to make it easier to find the passage. Uh, and that happened in 1227 when Stephen Langston, an Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, put this together to kind of help people to be able to find verses. But then in 1382, the Wycliffe Bible was the very first one <clears throat> that was uh, that was out, that was published that actually used not just verses but also chapter divisions. So just keep that in mind. Now remember, chapter one, as we began our study weeks ago, we said chapter one was Christ as our life. Now we finished chapter one, and today we're moving into chapter two, and chapter two is Christ as our example. So Paul writing this letter says this, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, <clears throat> I want to take this verse, this very first verse, and ask a question. What's the there for, therefore? What's the therefore, therefore? Anytime you see a verse that begins with therefore, then you need to pause and ask yourself the question, wait a minute, why is that there? Well, in lesson six, we learn... Uh, the, uh, in, in the embryonic, that the embryonic stages of the church, that these believers were, first of all, to conduct themselves 
in a manner worthy of the gospel. In other words, we said, don't let your conduct, uh, you know, your, 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 your actions uh, contradict what you say you believe about who Jesus is in the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> and that was chapter one, verse 27. But then we also said that Paul told us and challenged us to stand firm in one spirit in verse 27, the latter part of that verse. And then the third thing we learned was that we're to contend or to strive for the gospel without fear there in verse 28. In addition, they, and, and by the way, by application, we are not only to call, call to believe in and on Christ, but also, as we said last week, to suffer for Christ. So Paul continues and he says this, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, in other words, if it takes, if it gives you encouragement to know that you're a born again child of God, uh, then th and that, that's an important element of the Christian experience. He also says that if any comfort from his love, now I got to tell you, you ought to be comforted in the sense that Christ loves you and gave his life for you. In addition to that, he says, if any common sharing in the spirit, in other words, if there is spirit led sharing among the believers and so forth, if any tenderness and compassion, Paul says. Now these are wonderful attributes that believers should be exhibiting. He goes on to say in verse two, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Now remember, Paul's in prison, chained to a Roman God, guard. And here all of a sudden he's saying, look, if you have encouragement in Christ, if there's love and the sharing in the spirit and there's tenderness and compassion and so forth, then, then, then when I hear this, it makes my joy complete because you are like-minded. Having the same love, Paul says, be one in spirit and, in, and of one mind. Now, it's important, Paul says, put the blinders on, think about the transformation that is taking place in your life through your relationship with Christ. And I want all of you to have this same mind about this. And in verse three, he says, don't do anything or do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In other words, get over the idea that it's all about you. It's not that we live in a me generation. Paul said, move beyond that. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. In other words, with a humble attitude, look at other people and value, put them above yourselves. You know, uh, we have this attitude today of, of just thinking of everything involves, the whole world revolves around us. It doesn't. Put others first. Verse four says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, this, today, what I want to do, and, and I have a limited amount of time to share this with you, but I want to take this apart for you and unpack this just a little bit in the following way. We're going to do part of this this week, and next week I'm going to elaborate more as we think together about unity in the, in, within the Spirit of God, within the family of God. But today I want to talk about the fact that the church faces two primary enemies of the gospel. And Paul was very concerned about this. And one of those things was, was that he faced uh, there, there's the enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ from without and from within. But remember this, Paul says, I want you to have be of one mind. I want there to be unity within the body of Christ. And we're going to look in a little bit later about how Paul's concerned about a, somewhat of a conflict in the Philippian church. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that in detail later. But I want you to be aware of there's always been an attack on the Lord Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, both from without and from within. Now, remember this, from without, remember the world hates the church because the church stands against the evil of Satan and mankind. And that's why in Ephesians chapter six, Paul would write to the believers there, finally be strong in the Lord and in the power uh, in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, there are people who are focused on doing evil in our world. They are the enemy of the church. But also in addition to that, there are spiritual forces in the heavenly reign. We're talking about demonic activity here. 
And he says, be aware of this, but therefore, in verse 13, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Well, friend, let me just tell you, the day of evil has arrived. And so not only did it happen in the first century, it has happened virtually in every century since then. And so we are constantly battling from on the outside of the church with a world that hates everything that has to do with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, Christians themselves by our very existence are an indictment on the lost world. And, and that is problematic for them. In fact, Paul makes a reference to this in chapter one, as we looked at previously. And so the bottom line here is there'll always be conflict from without. And if you think that the world is ever going to love or accept the true church of Jesus Christ, then you're deceived because it's not going to happen. But also from within, we have a conflict. Now notice this. John tells us in John, 1 John 2, don't love the world or, the, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything, listen to this, inclusive, for everything in the world. And then he breaks it down. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So Paul is warning us about the conflict that comes not just from the outside, because we're to expect that. That's kind of the norm. But he's concerned about the problem of the conflict and the attacks from within the church. Let me take a moment and just say that woke teaching is permeating the church. Now, I want to define wokeness real quick. Wokeness simply is, a, is one or an attitude, a position where you look at the world, you see injustice in the world and so forth, and your desire is that those injustices would be made right. Unfortunately, like so many words in our language today, being woke has been changed regarding its definition. Now, woke teaching just says that we have to see all these injustices and so forth, and we have to embrace them, and we have to force people then to accept the quote-unquote cure that certain people have for wokeness. And that just simply means to openly embrace any and every form of perversion that exists in our culture and society and so forth. And we've said this and we'll say it again. Every person has the right to choose their life, to live their life any way they want, but they don't have the right to force and impose their opinion and their position and their worldview on all of us. I want to just say today that my good friend, Dr. George Barna, who we worked with a number of years together in the political arena, has just released his latest survey concerning how COVID changed the church. Now, I want you to listen. In fact, I want to read some excerpts from his latest research, and I would encourage you to get this, and you can, you can find this at the... Uh, the American Worldview Institute, that's A-W-V-I, and it's called the 2023 Report. But let me just share some staggering numbers and statistics with you because we're continuing to witness the devastating effects of uh, COVID-19 combined with our societal responses. That involves, you know, government lockdowns, which we had, violations of our constitutional rights and church shutdowns. Uh, and how the impact of that had, and what an impact of that, of those things had on our faith as Christ followers here in America. And so there are three significant areas where George dealt with, and I think is worthy of us to think about today. First of all, was church attendance, and then church affiliation. And third, and the most deadly of all, I think, are core beliefs. And so let me begin by saying this. George says, the post-pandemic research shows that a majority of Americans, 56%, attend church infrequently or not at all. The other day, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention, and kind of this will date the video a little bit, so pardon me for that. But I was at the Southern Baptist Convention, which was held in New Orleans, which is where I pastored for a number of years. I was on the plane coming home, sitting by a very lovely lady and sweet-spirited, an elderly black woman who was a the widow of a former pastor. And we were talking about how the church today and their church as well as churches everywhere, most have yet to recover from the loss of attendance that is numbers wise uh, that occurred during uh, the COVID situation. So here's the facts. First of all, prior to the pandemic, those who attended church infrequently or not at all 
was only 41%. But now, as a result of the pandemic, it's gone from that, it's dropped 15, 4%. I'm sorry, I got those numbers backward. It was 56% prior to the pandemic, following the pandemic, and a 15% percentage point drop. We're now down to 41%. That is a huge decline in church attendance. People have now decided they can sit in their own living room, drink a cup of coffee, watch this program or watch that program or stream this or stream that. The problem is, is that there's a biblical reason why that's not correct. And the Bible says, do not forsake your, the assembling of yourselves uh, together as the manner of some is. In other words, we need to be a part of a body of Christ. So we don't just go for what we can get, but we, we need to have that community, that body life that is a part of the church family. <clears throat> so if you're falling into that situation where you're just sitting at home and just watching, thank God for technology. I'm so grateful for that. But the truth of the matter is we need to be engaged in the local church. The second thing that happened was the number of Christians who self-identify as Christians contend, or number of Americans, I should say, who self-identify as Christians uh, continues to fall. And it went from 77% in 27% in, in, uh, in 2017 to a new low of 68%. That's a 9% decline. So in other words, the number of people who identify as Christians is dropping and it continues to drop in our culture. And because of the fact that social gospel has become so predominant in so many churches, so many people just simply embrace this, but others are fed up with it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The third thing is, is that uh, the, uh, the biblical worldview, and this is really uh, uh, the definition of a biblical worldview, is just looking at our world through the biblical lens, not, not as, as society sees it. <clears throat> and so during the pandemic, the biblical worldview decreased among all Americans and across all major church, group, church groups, by, and especially by one-third among, among evangelicals. So the group that grew the most as Christianity faltered, that was the group that's called the don'ts. And these people are people who don't believe in God, don't know if there is a God, and don't care one way or the other. And that group has grown from a 15% from, from a position in 2020 to a whopping 22%. That is a plus 7% increase in the don'ts. Now, the problem with this uh, particular survey and what it reveals to us is this, is that as we look forward to the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our lives need to shine Paul has exhorted us to stand for the gospel, to not be fearful of proclaiming the truth. And yet so many believers have chosen to disengage. They're afraid out of fear to stand up and speak up for those things that are right. And, and I got to just tell you that Satan is seemingly, okay, I want to emphasize, he's seemingly winning this battle, the cultural battle for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Ultimately, we know the outcome and he loses. But it is serious. This is a serious report that reveals a serious spiritual condition in America. And so we need to be aware of what is going on and to see how this plays out. But let me remind us all of something. In John 13, verse 35, um, the Bible just says this, they'll know we are Christians by our love. You see, we need to be engaging in a loving atmosphere, but standing firm on the truth. So Paul exhorts us here in this passage to stand as one in unity. Now further in Romans 12, 18, Paul would write this to the church at Rome. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, I don't try to antagonize people, but when I am in a conversation with someone I want to get to the reality that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. I want to get to Matthew 7, verse 13 and following, that there's a broad road that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to eternal life, and few there are that find it. The reason is that these are powerful words coming from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ 
for the purpose of reminding people that Jesus was a central figure who came to show us the Father, but more importantly, who gave his life to order in order to purchase us from our sin debt that would ultimately destroy us and separate us from God forever in a place called hell. I'm just going to tell you that this is the reminder that people need to hear. This life is temporary. Every person here is not going to get out of here alive, and they're certainly not taking anything with them when they go. The only ones who will get out of here alive are those of us who experience the coming of Christ, and we're going to be caught up with him, and then we will be changed. We'll be exiting this world, but not in the grave, but out of it. But the truth of the matter is, is that most of the world doesn't believe these truths. Secondly, they're ignorant of what the word of God says. And so Paul says, as far as it's concerning you, do your best to live in peace with each other. And so we don't try to be antagonistic, but we must stand and be truthful. You know, I just want to be frank with you today and tell you that personally, it grieves me to see how so many Christians claim to be Christians. And yet, again, two things. One, a, a witness is a person who opens their mouth and shares. And most people don't do that, as we've said over and over and over again. But then secondly, the life that we live negates our, even if we were to open our mouth, it negates that. Again, I'll say, it, I'll say this again. If you were arrested for being a believer, a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? And in far too many cases, the reality is there isn't. But let me kind of talk about a cultural situation here for a moment. I shared an article with some of our Bible study friends the other day <clears throat> that over 5,000 United Methodist churches have granted disaffiliation amid, amid the schism in their denomination over homosexuality. And, and so what I mean by that is this. And just to elaborate, the United Methodist Church has a hierarchy of bishops and so forth and so on. And they appoint a pastor to a church. And what's happened is, is that United Methodism, along with Episcopals and the Church of England and others, have, they, they've been ordaining now for a number of years uh, homosexuals, lesbians, etc. They're being put into these churches as pastors and stuff. And finally, people have stood up and said no. We are not going down that road. And if our denomination, that is, and I'm going to tell you, John and Charles Wesley would be turning over there in their graves if they were not already in heaven over what is happening in United Methodism. But the bottom line is they're saying we're sick to death of having, having these kinds of people stand up and re represent themselves as being spiritual leaders when in fact they are not. In fact, they're engaged in sin and then they're encouraging others to do likewise, and we're not going to go there. You know, it blesses me to see that there are 5,000 United Methodist congregations who are taking a stand and saying no. Now, I was just, as I mentioned a moment ago, in New Orleans at the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, this video is being made in 2023, so I want to be sure to date that so you know what I'm talking about. But the Baptists, the Southern Baptists, uh, they voted uh, a couple of days ago to sever relationship and to make that a permanent sever severance with Saddleback Valley Community Church, which is pastored or was pastored uh, through the years by uh, a, a friend of mine, Rick Warren. And yet what's happened is, is that over time, Rick has kind of moved into an arena where they begun to ordain women as pastors and so forth. Now, let me be clear about something. Women are vital that God elevated womanhood. Uh, Jesus did himself when he came to this earth. And many of his followers, as you well know, in the early days, those who went with him and served and so forth, they were women. Women can teach. Women can serve. Women, and by the way, I've known a lot of women who are better preachers than a lot of men that I know. But here, And that's okay. But here's the issue. The issue at hand it's not whether they can serve or teach or whether they're valuable. No, all of those things are given. Given The issue is whether or not they can be ordained as a pastor of a church. Now, here's the issue. The word of God is clear. This is really a pretty open and shut case. The Bible says this, as Paul would write to Timothy, that the, a pastor must be the husband of but one wife. And I'm going to tell you, the wife is not same sex. The bottom line is this is a man, it is a woman. And God has ordained that the pastor would be a man. 
Now, that is not to negate women, and I'm, I guarantee you somebody, there's going to be a woman or several women that are going to see this. They're going to be angry at me. I, I hope you won't be. I'm not trying uh, to, to slight you in any way. I'm just simply stating the truth of the Word of God. The Bible doesn't change with time. The Word is the Word. It is timeless. It is eternal. And these things apply. Now, the liberal scholar comes along and says, well, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, they were told not to eat pig meat and so forth and so on, not to touch any pig. And yet today, you know, football players, are, they have pig skin, football, and, and blah, blah, blah. And they always come up with some kind of foolishness to try to negate what the Word of God says in the New Testament. But let me remind us, the Old Testament came and Jesus came. And he said, I didn't come to do away with all this and so forth. But the bottom line is over time, those things have changed because those were cultural rules that had to do with the, the habits of the Jewish people in particular. That is not eating pork or pigs at the time, various other things. And we, we, we don't have time to go into this into detail today, but you understand what I mean. Having said that, in the New Testament, Paul is laying out the guidelines for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ the body of Christ, something that was not known in the Old Testament. Paul calls the church one of the mysteries of God. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so Paul now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is laying out the guidelines for the, uh, the polity of the local body of believers called a church, the gathering of the church of the Lord Jesus. And so again, Southern Baptists just said, we're not going there. We know that others have done that, but we're not. We're grateful for women. And this goes back to what those of you who are not Baptist, maybe you're Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever the case may be. So I'm not trying to convert anybody to, to uh, being a Baptist, but I'm just simply talking about in 2020, the Baptists published a document called the Faith and Message of 2020. And in that, they reiterate the fact that the requirement for a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. Now, let me move on from there. I just wanted to get that out because everything that's happening in the church in America today is pressure coming from without, that is attacking the church on the outside, but also from within. There's a movement coming in the church to marginalize the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, to rob us of our powerful witness. And as I drive down the road and I see these pride flags everywhere I go and and unfortunately and regrettably, some being flown at churches or so-called churches, it breaks my heart because Jesus Christ came not to save us uh, in our sin, but to deliver us from our sin. And the truth of the matter is that today, many, many churches are failing to preach the whole counsel, the truth of the word of God. Christ calls us out of a sinful world to be a unique, peculiar, set-apart people. And then he gives us a wonderful promise when he says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the things that God has in store for those who love him. That's my prayer for you today. You gotta run. God bless you. Have a great week.